that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel condensed. Number one, that he died for sins according to the scriptures. Number two, that he was buried, that he died. Jesus did not, um, he was not taken down from the cross. He was not replaced by somebody else like the uh, Muslims say. It was Jesus, the Son of God, died on that cross. He was buried, and on the third day he rose again. So we have the payment of sins, the death, and the resurrection. This is the condensed summary of the gospel. This is the most important truth. This is the truth for which so many people have died, preserving. And we as Christians, if there's any other basic truth that we ought to know in order to evangelize, is to know this truth. Because it is the truth on which everything in the Bible is based upon. The Old Testament, we won't understand the Old Testament unless we understand the gospel in which we're going to go into some points that are going to touch on that. This is the gospel condensed. And if our witness, if, if we're going to witness to others, does not include this, then we are not preaching the gospel. We may help the poor. You may feed the hungry. You may clothe the naked. But if you don't tell them what Christ has done for their salvation, for the salvation of their souls... We may help their temp temporary discomfort, but what about their eternity? Well, our job is to help people, but the most important way that we can help them is to lead them to the truth. We can give people good advice. We can listen to their sorrows, to their woes. We can try and help them with their difficult circumstances. But as, unless we give them the ultimate solution, to the predicament of life, which is death, we have not given them anything. There's many organizations that are out to help the poor. There are many organizations that are doing great humanitarian work. But unless the means and the ultimate objective of that is to proclaim the gospel, then it really does not have an ultimate effect on their soul. And the opposite is also true. If we preach to people without showing genuine concern about their situation, what does that say about us? If we go and we find a homeless person on the street and we start telling them about Jesus without worrying about the fact that, hey, they don't have anything to eat, then that really does not help our cause either. Because a, a, a person is more likely to hear you when they see that you're truly concerned about them. And often when we proclaim the gospel to people, people may interpret as, oh, we're just trying to convert them to our religion. We just want them to be Christian. When in, the, in fact, we care about their souls. We love them enough to tell them the truth. But love doesn't just equate in preaching the gospel. We should also care about their needs. And that's exactly what James tells us in James uh, chapter 2, verse 15 and 17. He says, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which they are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, it is dead, being alone. Meaning when we preach to someone, if we don't care about their immediate discomfort, then why would they listen to our message? See, that's a very important aspect of preaching the gospel. We see that about Jesus. Whenever he encounters situations that people were in need, they, they, they were sick or they were, uh, the multitude were hungry, he preached to them, but he also took care of their physical needs. But the ultimate goal was not just to give them a hot plate of food. The ultimate goal is not to just to give someone temporarily what they need, but to give someone the eternal salvation that comes through putting their faith on the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our ultimate goal is to save their souls. Our ultimate goal is to make disciples. In fact, this is what uh, Jesus tells us in Luke chapter 24 when he commissions the disciples. He said some very, he says some very important things. And let's go ahead and look at that. Luke 24 
verse 45 and 47 through 47. This is uh, Jesus speaking to his disciples after he goes through the Old Testament, telling them why it is that the Messiah had to die. And he comes to these important points. He says, Then he opened their mind that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached in his name unto all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. This is our calling, to pr- proclaim to the nations. In fact, in another uh, portion, he says, making disciples. So our intent is not just to lead them, but also to teach them. And Jesus says some very important things here that we should take into consideration, no, not into consideration, that we should pay attention to if we desire to proclaim the gospel to others, because this this is what he's talking about, about evangelizing. He says that uh, this is written that should, he says, thus it is written that should Christ should suffer and rise again on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name unto all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Meaning this is, this is not just a message to the disciples, to the apostles, because they just did not have the ability to be able to go all, to all the nations. This has been a baton that has been passed down to every subsequent generation of believers. And he says, what, what is the mission? And that repentance and remissions of sins should be preached. From what? From the message of the gospel. And notice that the very first thing he says is repentance. What does that word repentance mean? In in the Greek, it means to change your mind. It is a, a change in mind that causes a change in direction, which is very important part of evangelizing. Unless people know that one day they will be judged by God's law when they stand before him on that day of judgment, unless people know this, Why else would they turn to Jesus? Why would people turn to Jesus if they don't see their need for Jesus? That's why repentance is so important. It's not that repentance gives you salvation. It's that repentance causes you to turn to the gospel. You know, some people say, oh, well, if repentance is necessary, then isn't that a work? That's not a work. It's not the repentance that saves you. It's the gospel that saves you. But you don't turn to the gospel unless you find a need for it, unless you believe it. And we live in a time, a day, in a post, uh, post-Christian post Western world that doesn't feel like they need God. They're very satisfied in their financial situation. They have all the things they want, all the, thing they, all the things they need. A lot, of people think, a lot of people say, well, why do I need God? Why do I need Him? And this is the precisely the kind of thinking that a person needs to repent from, to turn away from that, to turn to God. And the way we do that, the way we, when we evangelize, is by using the law of God. Look at what the scripture tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. The Apostle Paul tells us this, seeing it is Romans chapter 3, verse 20. The Apostle Paul says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin for the law is the knowledge of sin the apostle paul tells us here that no one can be saved by following the law the law does not commend you to god it does not uh, you you won't be able to stand before god and say well i've done all these things and you should let me into heaven that's not the purpose of the law The purpose of the law is to condemn us. And the purpose that we use the law in evangelizing is to show people they're not as righteous as they think they are. The law, the purpose of law of the law is not the purpose of the law of God is not so we can use it to beat other Christians in the head with. And it's also not used to show unbelievers that we are better than them because we're not. But it is to be used as a mirror to show how truly great is our need for Jesus. Because when we see ourselves in the mirror of God's law, we see that there's no hope. The purpose of the law is to show that man has fallen 
profoundly short and that we have no ability to redeem ourselves. It's just like being in quicksand. The more you try to pull yourself out of it, the more it sinks you down. And that is precisely what the law of God does to a person who is sinful. If we were perfect, it would be absolutely fine. But we're sinful. And because we're sinful, we have absolutely no way of seeing any good in ourselves when we compare ourselves to God's law. So we use the law when we evangelize. And of course, we have to... Um, Ask the Holy Spirit to lead us because it, it could be very different. For example, if um, we're evangelizing to people that we work with or we're evangelizing to some stranger that we met on the street and that more than likely you'll never see them again. When we're evangelizing to people that are um, that work with us, it can be a day by day thing and we can do things with a little bit more patience. But the law is one of the reasons, one of the things that we are to use to show people their need for God. Because if we just come to people and we, um, you know, we tell them, hey, you know, guess what? Uh, Jesus died for your sins. They would just be like, oh, okay, great. You know, that was, that's very nice. Especially if they don't know why. See, not only does the Bible weigh our actions, but it also weighs our motives. Because sin is not only manifested in our actions, but it is the seed that is intertwined in our hearts. The Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, verse 9. This is what the scripture says. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is the condition of the heart of a person who has not been born again, who has not put their trust in Jesus. It said it is, it is desperately wicked. Sin is part of us. Sin is ingrained in our thoughts. And this is something that is openly observable for anyone to see. And, and, and we need, as Christians, to understand these principles. If uh, We need to, as Christians, understand these truths in order to be effective witnesses. This is something that when we talk to people that can plainly be seen. I mean, ask yourself, why is it that our greatest struggle is to do good? Why do we struggle so much to do what is right? Why is it easier to get angry than to overcome anger? Why is it easier to tell a lie than to tell the truth? It's easy to observe that inside every human being there is an inclination towards evil. And this is a fact that we can even see in children. Not that they're aware of it. But for example, you don't have to teach a child to lie. You have to teach a child to tell the truth. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. You have to teach a child how to share. And repentance is a turning from their inclination of sin and turning to God and his provision. And in turn, God delivers us from sin. Firstly, from the condemnation, from the fact that we are proclaimed guilty by the fact that we've broken his law. And then he delivers us from the power of sin as we walk day by day with him. But only after a person understands that there's a case against them. Oh yeah, there's a, a list of all the things that they've done that have broken God's law that they will have to answer for. And unless they understand that there is a case against them, then they will, they will not be able, unless they understand that there's a case against them, they will not truly be able to see the beauty in the gospel the remission of sins, they won't be able to see the good news. They won't see why the gospel is such good news. That's why, uh, you know, some of the hardest people to reach are people that are self-righteous and ones that don't believe that God exists. The ones that are self-righteous, they feel like um, they've done enough good that, that, like they, that they don't, haven't done anything bad that God would condemn them by. And the ones that don't believe in God don't believe that there's a judge. And in fact, when we look at the Gospels and we look at those that Jesus encountered, um, you had the Pharisees who were self-righteous. They felt like they lived and they had, you know, they, 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 they lived out the law and God approved them. And that's what they thought. They, they were very self-righteous. And then you have the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. They believed that this is it. And they need to know that things are not okay. And that's the purpose of the law. So, and like I mentioned before, sometimes we tell people that, you know, Christ died for them without letting them know why it was that Christ died for them, why he needed to die. 
Because unless they understand the fact that repentance is necessary,